What I want to propose to you is more a, a vision with a few anecdotes of, of the way there, but uh, there's been a lot of study of genetics, of our genes, of our genes as entities, and I assume that most of the big data out there is, is genetic, genome sequences. But actually, I'd like to argue that cells are one of the basic biological entities. Genes work in context in cells. Disease happens when a specific gene goes awry in a specific cell, and we have a very, very poor understanding of the cell types in our body. So I think we really need an atlas. Just like we have a mapping of all our genes, we need to have a mapping of all our different cell types. Now, pr previously, people thought that, well, we have a couple hundred cell types, and if you talk to immunologists, they'll say, uh, we actually have a couple of hundred immune cells, and if you talk to a T-cell biologist, he'll say, wait, we have a couple hundred types of T-cells. And so one of the reasons we, we were limited till now is, is dimensionality. So what does a cell type look like? Well, look at this little outline of, of what I call cell space. Our, our genes have proteins in them, markers, and basically a cell type is a gene that's expressing a certain combination of, of proteins. So if you look at this as a mathematical grid, a coordinate grid, if we have two coordinates, protein in one and protein two, we see a bunch of cells that are expressing protein X high, uh, protein Y low, and the opposite are way around, and so we define two cell populations. But once we look at higher dimensions, we actually see that, that this is misleading. Um, it's actually mixing two cell types, and if we had looked at a third protein, protein Z, we actually have a splitting. So rather than having two cell types here, we have four cell types. So actually, to, in order to map, understand, and characterize our cell types, the first thing we need is we need to look at cells at high dimension to try and find what type of combinations or how our proteins are in cell space. So what we want to do is collect a lot of single cells, look at multiple proteins in each individual cells, and see how they map, what structure they form, what geometry they form in the cell space. And finally, uh, we are able to do that. There's the CYTOF, uh, which was uh, developed here with my close collaborator, Gary Nolan, uh, MIBI, uh, giving a spatial context, and single-cell RNA-seq is really coming of age to begin mapping all the cell types in our body. So this is the holy grail, and I, I would like to argue that the immune system is actually a very, very good system in which to try and do this. After we collected the, this data, millions and millions of cells in many, many dimensions, what are we going to do with it? How are we going to analyze it? How are we going to find and characterize and interpret these cell types? Computation is the key. The first thing we need to do is we need to take this complexity, many, many dimensions, and try and bring it down into to less dimensions. We want to reduce and find the most important dimensions that, that characterize our cell types. Typically, a lot of big data involves linear reduction. Linear math is easy, it's quick, it's robust, and it's the first thing people do. And here's data uh, collected uh, here at Stanford at the, the Nolan Lab, bone marrow with uh, 13 different markers, and we could take uh, linear dimensionality reduction, finding the most important uh, dimensions, and map it down from 13 dimensions to two. And you see that the different cell types, each color here represents a different cell types, sort of segregate one family of immune uh, cell types, another sort of split apart, but you don't really get a nice separation. Because the system, the cell system, the immune system, and any other cellular system is nonlinear. If we take a linear dimensionality reduction, we actually get a separation. So here's an algorithm, VSNE, based on the t, uh, t uh, SNE redu uh, linearity reduction method. And without knowing anything about our immune system, each cell subtype, as, as colored up here, is situated on a different place on the map. And this is really helpful because as, as, as humans, we actually like to see the data. Big data is complex. We sometimes, many of our computational algorithms have assumptions that could be wrong, but when we see the data, when we are able to approach the data and its patterns visually, we can best learn about it. So actually, visualization techniques are really, really important. And now we, can, um, we see this map. Each dot here is a single cell, and it's plotted as whether it's similar or non-similar uh, in terms of the map. And we can see the same map in, in three dimensions. So this is the exact same data, but now we map it to the best three dimensions. And you can see that our immune subsets, they're actually not round, convex, ellipsoid balls as they typically are, are described, but they're actually 
formed into convex, concave, complex shapes and manifolds that twist and turn. Again, every coordinate is, is a different combination of markers. And actually, these shapes have meaning. These shapes actually explain the function, the abilities, and the boundaries of these cell types. I want you to take a quick look at the green cells. That's the B cells that we'll be talking about later. And notice how these twist and turn. So the next thing we need to do, I mean, this is just a mapping, a visualization. We actually talked about identifying the subsets. And the thing is, the surprising thing is, we actually don't know the majority of the cell types in our body, which is really shocking, but we only know a handful. And now that we have these high dimensional methods, more and more new cell types are being derived all the time, many of them that play a critical role in disease. So the first thing we want to do is we want to be able to take millions of single cells and, and separate them out, put them into bins of cell type. And a really good way to do it is, is our algorithm phenograph that actually takes each cell and builds a graph, connects it to the most similar cells. It's actually a social network for cells. And once we build a social network of cells, connect each cell to its most similar cell, we could use standard social network algorithms of community detection and find these communities of single cells. And this accurately finds all known uh, um, immune cells very, very, very accurately. The key here is actually to get a good distant notion of distance, because if you just connect them in a simplistic manner, you won't get it. And our trick was actually, tell me who your friends are, and I'll tell you who you are. After we look at the distance in the high dimensional coordinate system, we actually say how many shared neighbors you have. And this really allows you to get a very accurate, refined map. It allows you to find these rare stem cells that are only a tiny fraction of the system. It allows to select for features that actually define a cell type and really get this accuracy, which I showed you earlier. This algorithm is incredibly robust when you're applying it to the healthy system. And once you apply it to a healthy system where you know the answer, you know that it runs really fast. If you're talking about big data, one thing you have to do is you have to have it run fast enough so, so you'll get the answer. We can apply it to systems which we don't know. In this case, cancer. And there was a big question out there, what, what type of subpopulations do we have in cancer? And particularly, what, how do we find the subpopulation in cancer that initiates the tumor anew? That cancer stem cell that's capable of recapitulating the entire tumor. And if you look at healthy cells up here, this is the healthy stem cell. We see that red blot here. This is the markers it's showing. That red thing on top, at the, um, everything there is red. That's CD34. It's the stem cell marker. And you see that it signals the same. The red are signaling. But when you look uh, here at the cancer, we see that while they signal the same way, the CD34 is all over the place. And so what we see is that there's a disassociation between the outside, what the cell looks like, and the inside, what the cell is doing, how it's behaving. And this way, we were able to recognize and identify the cancer stem cell in a way that actually predicts your survival. Uh, we were talking earlier about um, immunotherapy. Here is actually immunotherapy data. We applied it to, uh, to uh, the, the lymphocytes inside a tumor, and we actually see many cell types. Actually, to limit yourself and say, we actually think we should find what we see in healthy blood inside the immune subset is very different. And specifically, we see that each patient has different. This PD-1 that Nir talked about earlier, it's a break. It's uh, expressed in some tumors, but we have actually 10 breaks. And we see that different tumors have different breaks uh, expressed in their different subtypes. And this way, we could actually characterize in a patient-specific manner, leading to a personalized immunotherapy. Finally, I put things into bins. But if you want to go beyond that, actually, we have a continuum of cell types. This is actually macrophages growing in a dish. And you see this smear over time. We see that it's actually bins is the wrong thing. The discrete approach actually finds these dominant cell types, these, these hills. But that throws out 60% of the cells. So we want a trajectory-based approach to order the cells according to their chronology. And if we look at it high dimensional, we can both order them and pinpoint key events when they proliferate, when important things happen. And again, the bane, the computational challenge, is this incredible complex nonlinearity. Uh, this red line is how B cells develop, the B cells that were discussed earlier. And you add to that the fact that big data is powerful but messy, it's really hard to find that curve in that cloud. 
again, the answer is this graph-based geometry, just like we used in phenograph to actually work out the space, the space of cells, uh, the high-dimensional space. We look at the starting cell, we build a graph based on cells that are similar, and if we want to go to the distance, we take short steps that we feel more comfortable with. A little bit more complicated than that, but again, using this algorithm, we could get a perfect recapitulation of the progression of the development of B cells from its very first step all the way to a, a, a B cell that is ready to go. This is, an, again, an incredibly robust algorithm. And what we managed to do is we managed to do this at such accuracy that we could identify three novel progenitor subtypes, subtypes that weren't known before. And these subtypes are actually doing very important things. The VDJ recombination, which Scott talked about earlier, it's happening in those subtypes that we managed to pinpoint, as well as entire new regulatory systems. And so what I want to note is not only did we find them, but these are very rare. There are only seven in 10,000 cells. So in order to be able to get this map atlas, we have to go to big numbers. We have to go to hundreds and thousands and millions of cells. 96 cells is not going to cut it to actually capture the diversity. And these are very important cells. They're a regulatory checkpoint. If these go wrong, cancer can emerge. Finally, after we map our cell systems, after we map our cell types in this high dimensional space, we actually want to learn the networks. And we can actually view cell geometry as what is the cell type. But we actually can use more subtle variation in many of the regulatory markers in an individual cell to directly learn networks from single cells and subtle variations in these single cells. Here, we're looking at T cells. We're looking at the dependencies with each, in each T cells. And we can actually capture their regulatory network. This is T cells responding to TCR, and you can actually see the dynamic response down the cascade as these sigmoids get activated. Learn directly from these single cells. These signal cells actually vary. They're different between different cell types. While the wiring is the same, the function, the way these cells compute are dramatically different. Even more interesting, we can actually see how these go wrong in disease. In the case of a diabetic a model for diabetic mouse, we can actually see where in this cascade, how these wires go wrong in their computation and pinpoint where it happens. And understanding these networks and where they go wrong and being able to perturb them in a slightly sense can get to the DJ model that, that Nir is, it, we talked about earlier. And combining it all together, these networks change over developmental time. So we want to find the cell types, their developmental course, how they develop, how they function along the develop, the regul regulators of the development process, and the regulators of the process itself, how these get derailed in disease. Many diseases are, occur just when the, these regulatory networks uh, go awry. And finally, I showed you data mostly based on CITOF, but we're limited. That was only 30, 40, 45 dimensions. Many of the regulators cannot be captured with antibodies, so we need RNA-seq. We need to go genome-wide at single cell level. And we need, again, millions of cells. Fortunately, just yesterday, two um, groundbreaking technological papers that allow us to get the single cell RNA-seq were published. And now we can combine both CYTOF to get millions of cells and to get that structure I was talking about of the cell space and single cell RNA-seq to get the full regulatory networks and connect them together to get this holy grail map cell atlas of the cell types in our body and how they function and how they go awry in disease. And this was joint work with uh, Gary Nolan and many of the talented people in his lab. Uh, the little immunotherapy was with the Jim Allison and Pam Sharmi and MD Anderson and my super talented graduate students and postdoc work on the, on the computational methods, Elad, Jacob, Michelle, Manu, and Smita. <laughs>